uh, welcome uh, everybody to the 2014 edition uh, of a Shanghai lecture. Um, we, this year we have many, uh, some new partners. Uh, we will talk about this later on. I, I wanted to, today we have um, another, uh, as usual, we have a very interesting session. The, um, uh, the first speaker will be Rolf, which will give us a, a general overview on the really ba basic uh, of this uh, lecture series. But as you know, it's uh, um, an AI, an approach to AI and robotics, which is highly holistic and uh, uh, goes uh, around the idea uh, of embodiment. And uh, uh, who is better uh, uh, suitable for that than Rolf, who someone used the dub uh, uh, as uh, Mr. Embodiment. Uh, so we, we have, uh, um, as usual, uh, for those uh, who already know our, our lecture series, we have a main track where the basic ideas uh, underlying our vi the vision of our community about AI and robotics, but what we call embodied intelligence, um, are uh, in a more didactic way are explained. And then we have guest lectures which uh, um, focus on some specific aspects, uh, usually on cutting edge of very recent research. Today, uh, the, let's say the main track will be uh, started by Rolf, while uh, the, uh, we have a, 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 very, another, a very interesting guest lecture by Ko Ozaka, um, Ozoda from the Osaka University on uh, something which is very related to embodied intelligence, uh, which is uh, if also uh, go in the area of soft robotics. So the presentation will be about, we will, I will do some more introduction later after coffee break. It will be um, muscular skeletal bionic robot. So it's a cutting edge uh, uh, robotics topics. But we have an holistic view. Uh, I don't think uh, we need to introduce uh, Rolf Pfeiffer, who actually was the founder of this lecture series and is probably a leading thinker in, in the area of AI and robotics if you want to keep uh, the two disciplines divided. So uh, I don't want to, to tell uh, anything more. And uh, I leave uh, the word to Rolf. So welcome, uh, Rolf. The floor is yours. OK. Thank you. Oops, we have uh, an echo there. But OK, so thank you very much, Fabio. Thank you for the introduction. Do we have a problem with the connection? No, no. Yeah, is it okay? All right. Okay, well, thank you very much for the introduction, Fabio, and I'm very happy that everyone or many people are back. So welcome to the 2014 edition of the Shanghai Lectures, uh, to the previous participants, but also to the new participants, of which we have quite a few this time. Okay, so what I would like to do is, you know, it's really some very, very basic stuff. Uh, I will say a bit about what the goal of this lecture series will be, and then start with some very, very elementary stuff. Okay, so it's a global, let, let me see. So, Shanghai Lectures, an experiment in global teaching, Right. And uh, today it's from Osaka University. Next week uh, will be, I will be talking from Shanghai Jiaotong University in China. And on the 13th of November, I will be talking uh, from the uh, University of Zurich. Just for uh, geo geography, because people may not be so familiar with Osaka. So here is, you can see uh, Japan and uh, China, Korea and Osaka is sort of in the center uh, of Japan. Okay, so lecture one, intelligence and eternal conundrum. I think for thousands of years, people have been fascinated by intelligence. And so it's a topic that also from my say, societal point of view, it has a very, very high value. So basically you can tell parents of, of a child 
that the child is cheeky, that the child is lazy, but you are never ever allowed to say the child is not intelligent. So I think it has very, very high value in society. So what I would like to do now is here are the goals of the entire lecture series. So what is intelligence, natural or artificial, sexual, technical know-how. Um, and one of the things that's also important is, like if you open the media now, almost every day you find something about robotics, about intelligence, about artificial intelligence. And so you should be able at the end of the lecture series to have an informed opinion on what to think about cheaper reports. And things I would, one of the really important things that we would like to show is that things can always be seen differently. You know, we have our prejudices. We think it has to be this way. It cannot be different. And we would like to show yes, it can always be different. We will present new ways of thinking about ourselves and the world around us. And as uh, Fabio mentioned in his introduction, the main theme, the main topic. But I want to tell you today, I want to give a bit of a broader perspective. So let's start with informed opinion media reports. I just picked up randomly a few. I could have taken a hundred others, but these seem to be nice. This is from the BBC website. It's, it's uh, uh, on the left, you know, sex uh, topic that people are interested in sex uh, with robots. And we marry robots, will we be able to have marriage with uh, robots in the future? And some people like David Levy in the UK thinks this will happen before too long, at least in this century. We'll see. Another, I think, big topic is this, these exoskeletons, this one is called Rewalk, and the goal is for, to help people with lower limb disabilities to walk again with crutches. Here it's of course in Japan, everybody knows this, the, the Pepper robot developed by SoftBank, which is one of the largest uh, telecommunications businesses. And the person you see here uh, is on, in the picture is uh, Masayoshi Son, the richest person in Japan, the owner of SoftBank. And one of the reasons he is now, he wasn't actually, a month ago or two months ago, he was not the richest person, but because SoftBank, the company that he owns, owns about a third of the shares of Alibaba. And you know, when they went to the, to the stock exchange, you know, the shares went up and then actually he beat uh, the richest person in Japan. Now he is the richest person. Developed this pepper robot which is made for social interaction, and it's supposed to be selling at $2,000, uh, I think, starting next year. We'll see you know, whether that can actually be maintained. Another issue that many people are interested in is you know, our own intelligence. So this lecture series is not only about artificial intelligence, but about natural forms of intelligence. And this is also from the BBC website, is exercise good for my brain? So I lift weights. Will I then be more intelligent if I lift weights? So it's, it's a highly debated topic, but I think an interesting one. Another from this Robotics Trends newsletter, Abu Dhabi School hires robot teachers. So some teachers, some robots will teach basic math. In Korea, they had an experiment with uh, teachers, English language teachers, which then was stopped in 2013. But um, it should be interesting to see to what extent robots will uh, replace teachers in the classroom in the future. And I think after the lecture series, I hope you will have a better idea on what to think of this. Here is a video predicts robots will wipe out human work. So will it be the case that in about 20, 10 or 20 years time, humans will be completely out of work because robots will perform all the tasks that need to be performed. It's also a debated topic. Here, I think a very interesting one for the near future driverless cars. And by the way, driverless cars is not only Google, you know, many companies in Japan, uh, but also this is from uh, Volvo, 
and they will start next, I think 2017, they will start a big experiment with 100 driverless cars that will drive 50 kilometers uh, every day for, I think, three months uh, during rush hour traffic. So this in the area of Gothenburg uh, in Sweden. So Volvo, I think, is, is uh, one of the leading uh, uh, contenders here in this area. So not only Google or Tesla or you know what have you, but also I think Daimler, Toyota, uh, Honda, and so on. They all work on driverless cars. Here is another interesting topic that I got also from the BBC website. I mean, this is just a random collection of stuff. Is your toddler really smarter than a chimpanzee? You know, so some people say, well, chimpanzees are intelligent, toddlers are, but the toddlers and little, little children, you know, they are much more intelligent. What does that mean? What do we mean when you say more intelligent? You know, I think it seems like an obvious question, but once you start thinking about it, how do you know? How can you, how can you sort of test or how can you find out? whether, what that means, more intelligent, right? I mean, I often talk to journalists, and uh, then I say, well, you know, basically you're a journalist, you make movies, you make news reports, I build robots, it's more intelligent. Mm. It's not an obvious, there's no obvious answer to this question. Okay, well, I could go on for a long time talking about media reports, but I want to make you also a bit skeptical about what you see in the media reports. Okay, now, one of the important goals is that things can always be seen differently. And one of the, one of the, uh, yeah, and uh, basically also would like to introduce these new ways, these new ways of thinking about ourselves and the world around us and this notion of embodied. And we have a textbook, a very nice textbook, of course very nice, uh, called uh, titled uh, How the Body Shapes the Way We Think. And I would recommend everyone to actually uh, use this uh, textbook because uh, it, we, we roughly follow, you know, the individual chapters of this book. There is a Chinese translation for. I see we have uh, Chinese, of course, from Shanghai Jiao Tong University, and uh, we have uh, also from Xi'an, I think, uh, Chinese University participating. So this would be the Chinese version. By the way, the Chinese version is much cheaper than the English version. And we have a Japanese translation of the book, Shino no Genri, which was actually, in fact, uh, uh, edited or translated by Akio Ishiguro of Tohoku University and Ko Hozura here of Osaka University. And I'm very happy that Ko Hozura is actually sitting in this room and will be delivering the guest lecture today. Now, this, this textbook can be complemented by uh, this book, uh, Understanding Intelligence. Uh, maybe you don't want to read the whole book. It has 700 pages, so, you know, but it's very heavy. It's about uh, two and a half or three um, kilograms. But I think a lot of basic material you will find in there. Okay. Now, this was just general introduction, and I would like to start with characterizing intelligence, thinking, and cognition. So what is it? Now you are expecting me to tell you what it is, but let's turn it around. You tell me what you think intelligence is, and I will try to write something here, which is going to be challenged. Okay. Anyone, would anyone in the lecture hall venture a, well, how, you know, what is intelligence? How can you characterize intelligence? What does it imply? Anyone? <laughs> right, then okay. I will uh, try and see if I can just tell it here, okay. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. 
Any suggestions? Okay. Let me let me just make a suggestion myself. What about learning? It's very challenging here to write. What about learning? I think learning is a good one. A system that always does the same thing, irrespective of any changes in the environment, we would not consider very intelligent. Right. Okay. Other suggestions? What about often often we think that the ability for making abstractions is the size of the system. Okay? Any other suggestions? Language, right? Language is very important for someone, you know, for example, animals don't speak. So we have to make Then animals. Language, I think, is a good one. Another suggestion. Some of these are, you know, any others? Do we have any others? Say. Some people think ability to predict is a sign of intelligence, you know, to anticipate. Okay, I think that's probably, maybe that's probably enough for the moment. We could go on for a long time. And I think the point here is, you know, you can say, well, this, and we can always discuss. So I think it's going to be difficult to come up with a definition. Okay, so let's continue here. I got this definition here from the Penguin Dictionary of Psychology. Few concepts in psychology have received more devoted attention and few have resisted clarification so thoroughly. So, I mean, many, many, there are hundreds and thousands or tens of thousands of researchers in the field of intelligence, and uh, they have all tried to come to grips with the concept, you know, tried to define it hasn't been very successful. But the, the point is, I think you don't need a definition. Let me, let me just uh, make the point here. So, in I think this was in 1927, the Journal of Educational Psychology asked the leading psychologists of their time to come up with a definition of intelligence. 
Now look at some of them. Look at some of them. Uh, so here, the ability to carry out abstract thinking. Yeah, we had that before. Having learned or ability to learn to adjust oneself to the environment. Now, what I like here is, for example, this one. I mean, in a definition, what is a relative situation in life, in a definition? I think this terms like that do not belong to definition. I would look at the next one, a biological mechanism by which the effects of a complexity of stimuli are uh, of stimuli are brought together in a given uh, and given a somewhat unified effect in behavior, you know, a somewhat unified effect in behavior and the complexity of stimuli, whatever that means, and whatever a somewhat, I mean, things like that do not belong into definitions. So what you can, what you can see here is that even, you know, sort of the best psychologists struggle with, uh, you know, giving definitions. So I don't think um, uh, it's maybe not a very good idea to actually for a definition. There was a website with 70 definitions. It's now defunct. Maybe they gave up. And like one of the leading researchers in the field of intelligence, Robert Sternberg, he said there seem to be almost as many definitions of intelligence as there were experts asked to define it. Right. So we're not... And if you look at the definitions, they're all plausible, but they're all a bit strange. And then some people try to see what you know what's really the common idea. And here again, it's just stuff. And then what they come up with is they 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 give their own definition. What they come up with is actually very interesting. They basically say, well, intelligence measures an agent's ability to achieve goals, wide range of environments. So we have this term. So basically, I think they're pushing everything to term goal. Now, what is a goal? So an ant, you know, these little uh, uh, animals, ant, if an ant carries back, let's say, finds, goes out foraging, finds a piece of food, and brings the piece of food back to the nest, and drops it in the nest, has, this, has it achieved a goal? Or, let me give you an example of a very nice experiment that I did. So, I think it was German television. So they went to a movie theater, and at the entrance they gave people a bag of popcorn. You know, many people like to munch popcorn during a movie presentation. And some people got a small bag, and the others got a big bag. And then, you know, they, they basically weighed the bags, and when people came back, they had to give the bag back, and they would weigh the bag, and they could measure how much they had eaten. Now, the people with the big bags had all, I mean, significantly more popcorn than the people with the small bags. I mean, there was, they both were an empty. Well, there was still stuff in both bags, but the ones with the big bags had eaten more. Did they have the goal? I mean, so when we talk about goals, we have to be really careful what we mean by a goal, and there's a whole debate on what that what that could actually be. Maybe we can have this debate at a later point in time. But start thinking about this. You know, you start you scratch here. Did you have the goal to scratch here? Okay. Also, one trouble with defining intelligence is that it's very subjective. Okay. Now let's look. Uh, let's look at playing chess. Let's look at playing chess. So, personally, I can play chess, but I'm a very mediocre chess player. So, if you were to observe me playing chess, you wouldn't be very impressed by my level of intelligence. Right? However. If you now replace myself by a little baby girl, and the baby girl would make exactly the same moves as I did, so the behavior is exactly the same, you would be very impressed by the intelligence of this little girl, and if you replace the little girl, 
and the dog would make the same moves as I did, then you would think the dog is a genius. So the behavior is identical, but in one case you think not so intelligent, and in another case you think very intelligent. So it depends on your subjective expectations. So we see, you know, it's getting more and more difficult to actually agree. It's very hard to agree. Can you come up with necessary and sufficient conditions? I can, I can tell you, no, we can't. And our robots or ants, I talked about ants before, are ants intelligent? Well, we can come up with pros and cons. Pros, why it makes sense to consider ants as intelligent. And we can give cons, why it doesn't make sense to consider ants as intelligent. Right, so can you, does anyone in the lecture hall have an idea of why we might want to consider ants as intelligent beings? Uh, maybe we can let's maybe we can hear the pros. Let's, see. Okay. let's start with the pros. They have actually some learning abilities, some considerable learning abilities. So that's what one of the characteristics, you know, that we think. What else? Why would you? want to consider ants intelligent. Anyone? Okay, they have very sophisticated social organizations. Santana from a student, but it's probably already there. They can work in groups. Okay. I say cooperation. Cooperation. I can be Ant from Moscow. Uh, Ron, can we Ant from Moscow? Yeah, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, language. Of course, they have their own language, but they don't have verbal language. Okay, so they have uh, communication skills, some communication abilities. But language, lack of language, linguistic like abilities. Language. So that would be a part. No language. I mean, not in the no sense language. that we have. Right? Yep. So, no language. And one that I also like is no math. They cannot do math. Or at least we think they can. We don't really know, but we think of math. Okay? What else? Well, I think we already we already have a good uh, a good series of of, uh, of uh, properties. You know, we could add general abstract lack of abstract thinking. Also, uh, let's say very limited uh, brain plasticity. So, but you know, we could add more. So we see, well, you know, ants are intelligent, but maybe they're not so intelligent. And so are they intelligent now or not? Well, I think it's a mute question. I think the better approach is, the, the better approach is to ask the question or to say, well, even a particular behavior of interest, for example, how ants cooperate on a particular task or how they find the way to the best. How does it come about? How does it, you know, what are the underlying mechanisms? Okay? I think that's much more clear. Now, I think one way in which you can try to find out whether someone or something or a creature or a, a robot is intelligent or not is by observation. You observe the behavior of the people, and I think then you can already say. A lot, and I would like to show you two videos 
One is a very old one that was done in Japan, here in Japan, Robo-B, where a robot is interacting with a class of small students. And I think it's very entertaining, very amusing, and you can learn a lot of what these kids do, how they interact with the robot to find out whether it is intelligent or not. Uh, and then the, the iCup uh, attention video. So now done, can you play the video? First one, Robo-B. Okay. この研究所の石黒博史さんたちがキャッツも大きなテーマです。人と友達になれるロボットを目指して開発されたロボビー。この研究所の石黒博史さんたちが研究を進めているものです。ロボビーは言葉を交わしたり、体に触れ合うことで。人とコミュニケーションが取れるように設計されています腕や腹など16箇所にある銀色のシートは感圧センサーです人の皮膚に当たり触ると敏感に反応します相手からの働きかけに対し800通りの行動パターンを自分で判断して返しますセンサーを撫でられたり優しい言葉をかけられると人に甘える仕草も見せます。しかし実社会に出してみるとまだ課題が山積みであることが分かってきました。小学校でロボビーに英語を話させ、海外からの転校生として子供たちと友達になれるか観察しました。あちこちのセンサーを触られ、複数の子供から話しかけられたロボビーは、誰と話していいか分からず、混乱してしまったのです So okay, so you, you can see that they're trying to interact with the robot, and you know one of the I think one of the ideas is that they would like to find out to what extent this robot is actually intelligent. And uh, the next video uh, also shows something very impressive, and it's it's also an old uh, video, but it shows it basically follows people. It looks into people's eyes basically, and when some a robot looks into people's eyes they get the impression that they're actually looking at you now again the question when you say looking at you what do you really mean by that when you say looking at you okay think about this a little maybe we can have a discussion later on so now done can i have the icap video now okay this is from a european project for developing this I got video, but I think it's very impressive. You can see. You think it's interested in what's going on, right? So I think the eye contact is something that's really interesting. Okay, I think that's that's enough. Thank you, Nathan. Okay, but again, you know, when you interact with robots and you try to observe what they do, it's very subjective whether you consider that intelligent or not. Right? 
And so uh, there is uh, a famous mathematician that you all know, you know, every basically student in the world knows Alan Turing. And he was fed up, you know, when you, you discuss about ants, you say, well, are ants really intelligent? Well, I don't know, but they can do this. Yeah, but that's not really, you know, kind of these sort of discussions. And he was tired of these kinds of discussions. And he said, why? And he was a real scientist. He said, there should be an empirical test. You apply the test, and then you can say intelligent or not intelligent, right? That would be ideal. And he suggested a game, I think that many of you know, it's called the imitation game. So basically, you have a judge, and then you have a wall, or in a different room, a person is sitting, or a computer is sitting there. And the, the, the judge, through question, through asking questions, has to figure out whether, at the other end, there is a machine or a computer. And if it can't figure out you know, whether it's a machine or a computer, then you can say the, the computer, you know, if basically the computer imitates the answers of a human being so that the judge cannot tell the difference or cannot say, well, you know, it's really a computer, then the computer has been successful at the imitation game. You know, that's the Turing test. Now, Turing himself has uh, a more sophisticated version. I, will, I don't have time to go into this. I think Fabio is going to tell me that my time is soon, will soon be up. So Turing has a you more sophisticated time. version. So please read it. It's in the slides. It should be on the website. And then there are people like you know, John Searle, philosopher John Searle, who doesn't agree with the Turing test. And he has this. Uh, experiment called the Chinese Room Experiment, Thought Experiment, and I don't have time to go into that, but he is arguing that you can do that purely mechanically, um, and the Turing test is just input-output behavior. You don't know whether the system actually understands anything. Again, question, what do we mean by understanding? <laughs> These are all terms that we use all the time. But once you think about what do you mean by understanding, it's not so obvious what that actually means. Right, you know, what does a teacher do? For example, I'm a teacher. What does a teacher do to figure out whether the students have understood? Well, he or she asks questions. And then you get answers. Well, that's input-output behavior, right? So what else has there, does there have to be in order to talk about real understanding. So what's the difference between superficial understanding, just input-output behavior, and real understanding? So I think, think about the pros and cons of Searle's Chinese room experiment. You have a description in the slides. So please do that. I'm also looking, or Fabio is looking for a volunteer for a student presentation, a five to 10 minute student presentation on Searle's Chinese room experiment. Maybe a Chinese university would be appropriate for this. Maybe a Xi'an or, uh, or Shanghai Jiaodong University for, you know, because it's a Chinese room experiment. Now, there are many variations on the Turing test. So for a long time, people have been interested in that. And the first one, I think, was uh, really uh, Josef Weizenbaum's doctor program and I think it was very, very interesting. This is actually, this was in the 1960s. You know, this basically, let me see, 1960s. So this was about 50 years ago. He had built a computer program called the Doctor Program. And there was a visitor at MIT in Boston. There was a visitor from Russia. And they presented the program, the doctor program. So the doctor program said, good afternoon, please type in your name. At the time, they didn't have speech recognition software. And then the doctor said, doctor program, doctors, not the doctors, the program said, well, what brought you here? 
uh, to see me today. And then the visitor from Russia says, oh, nothing much, I'm feeling a bit tired, that's all. And then the program says, why do you think you're feeling a bit tired? Well, I've been uh, you know, traveling a lot and away from home. And then the doctor program says, tell me about your family. And then, actually, the person, the visitor from Russia, sends people out of the room because he gets the impression that this conversation is getting too intimate for you know other people to listen to. So basically they were he was tricked into believing that this program actually understands. And the program is probably the most stupid program any first year student can do it these days. It's just taking the, the sentence and then just rearranging, it's just a pattern rearranging and giving this back as a question, using the words of the person who typed, and that immediately gives the person a feel that, well, the program has understood me. And there are some forms of therapy, Rogerian therapies, where you do that, you know, say, well, I don't feel well today, and say, why, why, don't, why do you think you don't feel well today? You know, like that. No understanding whatsoever, just patterns rearranging and giving the question back. And then people project their own ideas of understanding into the system. So I think I still have a couple of minutes, right, Fabio? I think I still have a couple of minutes. Yeah, so you, you have about a quarter more, something more than a quarter of an hour. So you still yeah, have perfect. 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 Thank you. Okay. okay. So another, uh, let's say, extension of this Turing test is what's called the total Turing test. Now, in the, in the Turing version of the Turing test, it's only through language communication. So basically, the, the, the judge is sitting in one room, and in the other room, there's either a human being or a computer, and they don't see each other. They can only communicate through, an, an, uh, a, term, uh, through a, uh, a computer. Now, there is another version of the Turing test called the total Turing test. Let me see, TTT, where the uh, TTT, total Turing test, where not only the language abilities are, are tested, but also the entire appearance, right? So, for example, I look at the audience here, so I look at this young gentleman here sitting in the front. How do I know this is not a machine? How do I know it's a human being? So that's the total Turing test, you know, when you have the, the entire appearance. And I think there is a, a uh, nice uh, video, maybe not done. Can we show the uh, Blade Runner video? So this is a movie, it used to be a cult movie, Blade Runner. And Blade Runners, they were created by humans. They were programmed to live for four years, you know, and die after four years. And it, it's, it's a complicated story. But the idea is there's one guy who has to chase these Blade Runners, find them, because they were on some other planet, they came back to Earth, which they shouldn't have done. He has to chase them, so he has to find out whether they are replicants, called replicants, you know, these kind of artificial things, or whether they are real human beings. So he has to try and figure out, to, he has to sort of, wants to find out what the difference is between a human being and one of these robots, so to speak. I think it's a very nice video. Yeah. Here, if I talk, I'm kind of nervous when I take tests. Oh, just please don't move. I'm oh, sorry. This is the total Turing test, right? I already had an IQ test this year. I don't think I've ever had the one. Reaction of time is a factor in this, so please pay attention. I answer as quickly as you can. That's the hotel. What? Where I live. Nice place? Yeah, sure, I guess. Is that part of the test? 
No. Just warming you up, that's all. Well, not fancy or anything. You're in a desert, walking along in the sand, when all of a sudden... Is this the test now? Yes. You're in a desert, walking along in the sand, when all of a sudden you look... What one? What? A desert. Doesn't make any difference what desert is completely hypothetical. But how come I'd be there? Maybe you're fed up. Maybe you want to be by yourself. Who knows? You look down and you see a tortoise, Leon. It's crawling towards you. Tortoise? What's that? You know what a turtle is? Cork. Same thing. I've never seen a turtle. But I understand what you mean. You reach down and you flip the tortoise over on its back, Leon. You make up these questions, Mr. Holden? Or they write them down for you? The tortoise lays on its back, its belly baking in the hot sun, beating its legs, trying to turn itself over, but it can't. Not without your help. But you're not helping. What do you mean, I'm not helping? I mean, you're not helping. Why is that, Leon? They're just questions, Leon. In answer to your query, they're written down for me. It's a test designed to provoke an emotional response. Shall we continue? Describe in single words only the good things that come into your mind. About your mother? Your mother? Yeah. Let me tell you about my mother. <laughs> Okay. Okay, so you see that, you know, the emotions seem to play a major role in uh, this, this, uh, this whole endeavor to distinguish machines from uh, human beings. Now, the last video that I would like to show today is also, in a sense, you could say, relates to this total Turing test, and it's actually some of you may remember the Sony robot dog, Ibo. And here you have an Ibo interacting with a real dog. And the question is, of course, whether the real dog thinks that Ibo is a real dog, or, you know, so basically trying to test what, uh, whether, whether the other dog is real or not. So maybe, and now do you have to be, can you show the movie, Nathan? You have to be, the movie is only a few seconds, so you really have to watch closely. But I think it's a very good video. I like it very much. It was made by Luke Steels in Paris. <laughs> All right, so, so much about the uh, total Turing test. Okay, now, one of the things that we would like to be able to do is actually to measure intelligence. Now, how do you measure intelligence? You know, that's another way, you know, to say, well, you know, just measure it and you get a number and then you can say, okay, get 100 or 150 or whatever. And then the 150 is more intelligent than the 100, and so on, right? And you measure that. We all know that, of course. IQ, intelligence quotient. And here I have an item from an intelligence test. Now, would anyone like to venture an answer uh, for example, I don't know, from Shanghai, maybe? What would you say? What would be the answer? I think we've all been in this. Yeah, you're some high person.
Any suggestions? Can we? Uh, maybe. Uh, yes. Yes. Is it Maltese cross? The cross of Maltese border. Is it? The, can you hear me? It yes, looks like the, the cross of the Malta or the Maltese border. It looks exactly eight point cross of Maltese order, the Knights of Maltese order. Looks exactly. D, yes, D. absolutely. Ah, D, yes. okay. Do we have other suggestions? Here, Osaka. Yeah. F. So we have another answer. F. Why do you think it's F? There's a group of what you. Yes. Geneva. Why is it F? Is that an answer? The, the, the common elements between the, uh, the first two. The third is the common elements in the first two. Common elements. Okay. Uh, we have a, a candidate here. <laughs> the solution is F. Yeah. And why? Why? Because uh, it's uh, half. Difficult to explain. Uh, because uh, it's uh, the, the common, uh, um, the, third, uh, the third column uh, is the common uh, sign between the first uh, two columns. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. But, but it's, I think this one is relatively difficult. It's not always entirely difficult. <laughs> okay, so I think we can all do this. Now, And, and I think we're all familiar with these uh, intelligence tests and we're wondering what they really measure. And I don't have time to go into all this, but there are many, I think, very uh, interesting issues that have been discussed in the literature. And I would, uh, you know, we, we have some, I think we have some papers on the website. And uh, please, you know, have a look at them. I, I would just like to mention a few. One is, is the IQ in the genes or is it acquired during ontogenetic development? As you interact when you're born, you grow up to become an adult. This is called ontogenetic development. This is the famous nature-nurture debate. Is it by birth? You know, some people just lucky with a high IQ. Can you learn? And then, you know, the next question that is, is the attitude, right? Can you, through practice, improve your IQ? No, if, it's, if, it's, if you cannot, you know, if it's basically just by nature, if it's just nature, then you're either lucky or not. You know? But maybe you can actually improve it through training. I think it's an interesting question. Are there cultural differences? You know, or let's say Asian people, do they have higher IQs than uh, Caucasians in Europe and the United States? Or people in Africa? You know, also politically very sensitive issues. You know, you have to be very careful what you say. Another issue which uh, personally interests me very much, what about professional success? Why are some people with high IQ professionally successful, but others are not. What about emotional intelligence? How does emotional intelligence relate to IQ? What about in relation to brain processes? You know, does IQ relate to brain processing in what ways? And then, I mean, one of the points is, of course, IQ is one number, you know, just one number. Now, human beings, to characterize a human being with one number, a human being is such a complex thing. And as we go on, we'll see, we'll get a feel of the complexity of human beings. And just taking one number, you know, seems kind of silly, right? 
And so now people have developed tests for many different kinds of vulnerabilities, but just taking one number, maybe not so, not such a good idea. And then there is an interesting phenomenon that globally speaking, IQ has been steadily increasing. Now it's reaching a bit of a bit of a toll, but it's been increasing. Why so? Why has the IQ speculated about that? Okay, okay. I mean, I just wanted to raise this maybe maybe the smooth presentation also about whether it's a good measure measure of the winning to winning just or okay, okay. Let's now go to to artificial intelligence, which is you know the main topic or one of the main topics of this lecture series in artificial intelligence, we have three goals. First one is understanding biological systems, and there we don't care whether it's, you know, animals or, or uh, you know, ants, and, you know, we just say, we have a behavior, we find it interesting, how does it come about? Then we want to make abstractions, you know, find principles that not only hold for biological systems, but also for artificial systems. And then, of course, we want to build applications. And here we have a nice selection. We have Pepper, the social interaction robot. We have bionic legs. We have autonomous driving. We have uh, cleaning robots. And we have manufacturing robots. Now, the methodology that we use in artificial intelligence is called the synthetic methodology. So the idea is. The slogan is understanding by building. So we have a phenomenon that we're interested in, like recognizing a face in a crowd, how ants find their way back to the nest, how humans walk, you know, how we drink. And then we build a system that mimics these properties. And by doing that, we can learn a lot about how the biological system functions. And because we're interested in embodiment, anything having a body, we use robots typically robots, uh, as our tools or simulations, realistic simulations of these robots. And the point is we do not want to copy nature. We want to make abstractions. We want to understand the principles so that we can then apply the principles and make it even, you know, perhaps even better than nature as engineers. Okay, let me skip this slide. And we will see many, many examples of the synthetic methodology as we go on. Okay, now here is a point that I alluded to uh, very briefly, and it's IQ and professional success. So there is this club called the Mensa Club, and if you have a high IQ, I think it's on the order of 140 or more, you can become a member of the Mensa Club. And now the question is, why is it and, you know, we've had uh, visits from the Mensa clubs for various countries in our laboratory. And some people there are professionally very successful, but others are not. How come? Now, there's a very interesting book by uh, Malcolm Gladwell. Let's see, maybe I can write this here. Malcolm. Gladwell. Well, it's not very neatly written, but Malcolm Gladwell, and he wrote this book, The Outliers, The Story of Success. So he started exactly with this question. Why are some people successful? Why are others not successful? Even though both have a very high IQ. And start thinking about that. I can really recommend this book. It's very easy reading. It's very entertaining reading. You can read it in one weekend. And um, I think it's, it's, uh, it's uh, very profound. So please uh, uh, start thinking about this. And maybe we can also have, maybe Fabio, you can organize that. We can have a student presentation next week. Of and course, then I would, uh, yeah, I think that would be very nice if we could have that. So the assignments, let's say, from my point of view, would be read chapters one and two of How the Body Shapes the Way We Think. There are some additional reading materials on the website. And then the next lecture will be uh, cognition and computation, successes and failures, and why we actually need 
an embodied approach. So I would say this is it for the very general introduction. Next time we're going to dig deeper into the phenomenon of intelligence and we'll give you the reasons why embodiment is really at the core of any uh, intelligent behavior. So thank you very much for your attention. So maybe... Okay. I think uh, we, we may still have a time for some question, a couple of questions. About we are a bit into the coffee break, but I think we 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 can uh, allow a couple of questions or comments. Can, can I ask a question, uh, Rob? Hello. Yes. yes. Yes, um, well, uh, wonderful. Thank you. Great talk, as usual. Um, question about social social interaction. Uh, you say that robots will soon substitute humans, even in terms of social interaction. But um, what about emotional intellect? We know that there are robots with emotional intellect, but can robots replace emotional intellect of the human? Can robots replace the uh, emotional uh, intelligence of the humans? I mean, emotions. Right. How can robots? I think that's a very. I think it's a very important question. Uh, it sort of falls also. I mean, when? How do I know that, for example, you know, the other person actually has emotions? I mean, the the the, the point is a bit. There are many robots that try to recognize emotions in humans, of humans, and then react appropriately. They also have ways in which they can express emotions. You know, so it's basically at, at this level, recognizing emotions and reacting emotionally by adjusting facial expression or by adjusting the pitch of the voice, maybe even by adjusting body posture, they can, let's say, pretend to react emotionally. And then, of course, the question is, well, do they have emotions? Or is it necessary that they actually have emotions? Or is it sufficient that they basically display these, uh, these behaviors? I think it's an empirical question that has not been uh, investigated very deeply. I mean, many people are working on this. But I think we still are lacking results over extended periods of time. What we have is sort of very short interactions where people interact with the robots, like the pepper robot is a nice example. But we don't know how it is when people interact over extended periods of time with robots. You know, it's, kind of, it's a bit like the tour, you could say the emotional Turing test. I think a short interaction, you might actually be uh, seduced into believing that the robot has emotions, but maybe if you interact with the robot for a long period, longer period of time, then I think it might become obvious that uh, the you know, robot emotions are actually different from human emotions. But it's, uh, it's, I mean, I cannot answer in one sentence, you know, this is basically you're outlining a research area with, uh, with your question. Thank you very much. Okay, if uh, nobody has a uh, further questions, uh, I'm, I, have a, I, I would ask you, for, um, I have a, a very, uh, well, probably a big one, but uh, maybe you can uh, try a short question. Uh, you, you know that uh, we, uh, this summer there was some excitation in, in the press about the fact that the uh, program was able to pass the Turing test uh, disguising as a 13 years old uh, uh, boy, could you shortly comment on that? Uh, passing, passing the Turing test. I mean, it's uh, uh, what, yeah. I rem I vaguely remember that there was was something in the media. Yeah, it was. Did you say a thirteen? What was the the the, what yeah. was the computer imitating a 13? 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. In fact, it was uh, in the, actually it was during the Lobner Prize edition of this year, and uh, um, so actually uh, a majority of the review, let's say, of the people interacting in the committee interacting with this program actually believe it, that this program was a 13 year old boy. So um, important mm -hmm. media like The Guardian or The Independent uh, and actually around the world uh, reported that uh, hey, AI has really reached its objective because uh, uh, a program was able to pass the Turing test. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you remember okay. this. I mean, uh, okay. Uh, I think it's very interesting. That's you know one of the things I mentioned at the beginning. You know we should have an informed opinion about you know these uh, media reports. Yeah, I, so first thing uh, I think to be noted is this is really I think progress. It marks substantial progress in the field of artificial intelligence. So I think that's that's one thing. Whether you can actually say that the, the program passed the Turing test in the sense of Turing is another issue. Also, I mean, there's an issue of time. There is an issue of, you know, it's only at the language uh, communication level. So even though, you know, that program seemed to give the right answers as a human being would do it, um, it's still limited to this particular test situation. I mean, we would have to look closely at the rules of the Leubner uh, Prize competition, but it's definitely progress. But I don't think you know it's the it's the ultimate answer. And language language is not the only thing in which we communicate, especially if we uh, you know think about various questions about emotions. Also, I mean another example of a of a brilliant, uh, intelligent let's say so, somewhat intelligent computer program is Watson. You know IBM's uh, IBM's Watson. That can actually play, uh, you know, the game of um, what is it called? Uh, uh, trivia? No, what is it called? Uh, Jeopardy. 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 Yeah, the game of Jeopardy. You know, with these uh, with these questions, and it does a very good job at that. So I think there is definite progress. Whether you would say, well, that's passing the Turing test or not, I think that's a bit of a question. It's definitely not passing the total Turing test. Okay, if there are not uh, further questions, I think uh, we can um, thank Rolf uh, and uh, then we can join uh, again uh, at, uh, let's say, well, 10.15 at scheduled, uh, so five minutes from now. Or if, okay, let's say 10.20, 10 minutes from now after coffee break, uh, and the next speaker will be Ko Ozoda, uh, which will, okay, we will, I will talk about uh, that uh, after a coffee break. See you later. Thank okay, you. Thanks very much. Okay. Much. okay. Bye. Hello, I'm sorry. So, uh, before uh, saying uh, goodbye, uh, I think uh, we, we, you may, someone who, who may have guessed why we have uh, uh, a Berlin person at this table. And so maybe if Verena wants to say something, why she, uh, why are you here, Verena? Why I'm here? <laughs> um, actually, yeah, I can make some advertisement for the conference which is going on here. So that's the Epigenetic Robotics Conference and on development and learning. So if you want to um, find out more about how to design um, algorithms and, and models, how robots can develop and learn as children do, so please have a look at the um, Epigenetic Robotics EpiRob website, and that's why I'm here today. So uh, normally I'm in Be Berlin, um, and I also want to greet my students in Berlin. Uh, hello, everybody, and um, yeah, going back now to the conference. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you for coming. Okay, I think uh, that uh, yeah, I don't know if Rolf wants to say some final word or okay, so we can uh, uh, finish here and uh, to I, I don't really want to say you know a lot of final stuff, but I would uh, like to congratulate Verena, okay. who has just been appointed, uh, I think, associate professor. Okay.
<laughs> at the free uh, for, uh, Humboldt, is it Humboldt University in Berlin? Okay, so I think we should uh, congratulate her. I'm of course very proud because she is one of my former uh, PhD students. <laughs> okay. I pass the floor to Fabio. <laughs> I think uh, that uh, we can, for today, we can finish here. Next uh, lecture will be same time, uh, uh, same virtual place, uh, but actually uh, the lecture will be hosted by Shanghai Yao Tong uh, in, in Shanghai. So thank you everybody for attending. Uh, I think we, we had a good start to yet another great uh, session of lecture this year. Okay, thank you everybody. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>